thank you all for coming to today's uh, launch of the iPhone 6. <laughs> Uh, which, uh, <laughs> which reminds me, please, please turn off with, uh, all your cell phones of a very large crowd uh, today. Thank you. Uh, in Quebec, you know, it's a common greeting to say, bonjour, hi. And at the Jewish General, we've expanded this to uh, 22 versions of uh, bonjour, hello, buona sera, shalom, kalispera, hola, hola, assalamu alaikum, privyat, ni hao, and welcome all. I am Ruby Friedman, I am the Director of Geriatric Medicine at the Jewish General Hospital. Uh, firstly, uh, oy, oy, that's, that's a universal language I think everybody understands. Uh, we apologize to all of you who were reserved uh, so uh, early, but yet may not have a seat here or standing. Um, we've arranged to have a second room down the corridor towards the Côte de Neige entrance uh, or the via live uh, television uh, feed. So hello to all you there in TV land in the second uh, room. We didn't want to turn uh, anybody uh, away. We really felt the emotion of uh, all of you in the phone calls making the reservation. So we appreciate very much your commitment and understanding. So again, welcome uh, again to all of you to coming to the inaugural uh, Goldie Raymer Memorial Lecture uh, sponsored by her daughter, uh, Susan uh, Raymer and the Division of Geriatric uh, Medicine. Uh, we look forward to continue to present to you a, uh, oh, for several years, a, a outstanding and informative lecture series, at least on an annual uh, basis. On your chairs, you will find a white index card that we will collect after Dr. Gordon's presentation. And I ask you to write down your questions for Dr. Gordon on the uh, card. We would also appreciate any suggestions that you may have for future lectures. And if you wish, please to leave your name and email address. Uh, don't worry, there will not be any post-lecture solicitations of any manner or form. But if you would like to be informed of a future lecture series, please leave your name and email address. So again, questions for Dr. Uh, Gordon, suggestions for the future of your name and email address. And I'll collect the cards again after Dr. Gordon's lecture. Today's lecture is being uh, videotaped, and it will be, uh, I hope, shortly on the Jewish General Hospital uh, website. Uh, due to the large crowd today, uh, please remain in your seats uh, until after the question period, but you don't need to ask for permission to go to the bathroom. Now, an event like this, and this is really an event, it's, it's, it's far more than a lecture. It doesn't just happen. Uh, a lot of dedication, patience, and a smile are essential if you want something of this magnitude to succeed. In the midst of this uh, dizzying cyclone that's uh, me and Susan Raymer, we have the uh, calming uh, dedication, patience, and smile of Elizabeth Yakino, our administrative coordinator for geriatrics. And Elizabeth is the central booking number for the publicity, photography, printing, seating, snacks, the Montreal Gazette, CJAD radio, uh, for this lecture, extension 4352. Don't call her now, she's busy. Uh, Elizabeth, where are we going to put all these people? <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, please come forward. see down there. Susan, we have lots of time. 
what's the rush? It's only November. And her answer was, we have no time. We're really very late. <laughs> People are going away for Christmas, and then it's going to be Passover, and then it's going to be the summer, and it's going to be this, and it's going to be that. And we need to print flyers and call Tommy Schnurmacher and call the Gazette. It's late. I look around this room, and uh, we could have even filled up a, an upper deck. And all I can say is, I'm glad I listened to Susan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Division of Geriatrics. Thank you on behalf of the parents, your children, and grandchildren. You come forward a little bit surprised. Thank you, Susan, for opening up your heart and soul to share with us your experience of caring for an elderly parent, an experience that Susan has said, and we all know there's no training, there's no upper degree for this. It's an experience that can be overwhelming, frightening, terrifying, frustrating, and satisfying at the same time. I've been a geriatrician for 25 years. I can personally tell you, I've been there, I've seen there, I've done that. It's hard. I knew Goldie Gramer for a brief amount of time. She was a beautiful person through and through, always concerned about others. She would be very proud of what you've accomplished today. Maybe a little bit concerned that we skimmed on the refreshments. But thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> and our guest speaker today is Dr. Michael Gordon. It would be impossible for me to even begin to attempt to summarize Dr. Michael Gordon's career. Dr. Gordon is Canada's first Royal College of Physicians Certificate in Geriatric Medicine. He's currently Professor of Medicine at the University of uh, Toronto, Medical Director of Internal Medicine and Palliative Care at Toronto's Baycrest Health Science Centre. He is the recipient of many, many awards, including the Canadian Society of Geriatric Medicine Award in 2006, and Mentor of the Year Award by the Royal College of Physicians of Canada in 2008. He's author of many books and articles. Uh, you can read a lot on Dr. Michael Gordon on his website, Dr. Michael Gordon, that's drmichaelgordon.com. Uh, Maybe it should be .org, you're already an organization. But it's <laughs> also .ca. .ca, .ca, okay. I think that I could best describe Dr. Gordon by saying that I'm sure that his office is still full, as it was in the time that I was training at Baycrest. I'm sure it's still full with uh, lots of thank you cards, a wide collection of uh, wine, and a variety of homemade uh, cookies, and uh, home-baked breads, and mandelbrot from very grateful patients and their families. A doctor's doctor, it's who we would recommend if somebody in our family or friend would say, I need a doctor. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Gordon, who will present today's inaugural Goldie Lamer Memorial Lecture, Parenting Your Parents, a GPS for Elder Care. Dr. Gordon. Please. Whenever you give a talk, you're worried that somehow what you were going to show doesn't come out. So I always have a backup, which is I'll play the piano. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I don't see a piano. So it may be a virtual piano. You can listen in your heads. And I knew it was going to happen. Usually in the good old days, the bulb would blow. <laughs> but with computers, it's not the bulb, it's something else. So where's my talk? Ah. <laughs> There's a joke that ends with that punchline. Uh -huh. Okay, so what I, first of all, want to thank Ruby, Susan, for inviting me, for arranging as Ruby suggested. He, we met many, many years ago during his early days of training at the Baycrest. And um, yes, I do get baked goods, but the ultimate one I had was from one of my Greek patients who brought in a moussaka <laughs> that 
sustain the family <laughs> for about two weeks. And then I told her, I told the, the wife that I really couldn't do this anymore. Forget about our policy on gifts. I said, I can't order Musakana restaurant anymore because you're the gold standard. She said, okay, okay, no more Musakana. So a week later, she came in with baklava. <laughs> So that was easy because then I could spread around to the residents, right? Anyway, so I was asked to address the issue, parenting of parents, a GPS for elder care. Um, for all of you who have used the GPS, I only recently learned how to use it. Um, you know that it can be very useful as long as it knows where it's going. And when it doesn't, so I have a son who's a musician, he's 25, so they did a tour in the United States and they use the GPS. Uh, he borrowed it from me, I never got it back. But, and he said it was really great until they got to New York City. Because indeed it gave what was the best route, except it was right up 6th Avenue. And there they are with this van and a trailer. It took him about three hours to get, you know, three months. Anyway, so I'm going to try to give an overview of some of the challenges, some of the issues that all of us collectively face either as children of, spouses of, nieces and nephews of, or people who are being in the situation of having others involved in their care. And I'm assuming the only reason you came here was to hear something about that, and not because you thought this was a stand-up comedy routine and you were going to get it for nothing with refreshments. So I'll try to give you something that's useful. Okay, so why are we here? Now, aging, it's interesting because the media really is doing a number on aging. There's a lot of negative stuff. Um, but it's really one of the great achievements of modern times. In the past 60 years, life expectancy at birth has increased. Am I talking too loud? I'm from Brooklyn, I can't help it. It's like my wife who's from Winnipeg suddenly says, why are you yelling? You've never heard me yell. I'm just talking. <laughs> okay? So, in the past 60 years, life expectancy at birth has increased dramatically. Many diseases that a few decades ago were either fatal, certainly in my early days of training in medical school and early, or led to serious consequences, have been transformed into what we now call chronic disease management. We have Many people walking around, I call it the baggage, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and they are managed, and they can be managed for many, many years. And unless you've been there, you don't realize that there was a time that if you had one of those things, it was goodbye. And it was goodbye pretty quickly. So that's our new world. We don't cure too many things in medicine, but we're getting pretty good at managing many of them. Now, although this is America, the demographics of America and Canada are very similar. And this was a good one from a Time Magazine uh, article some years ago. Now, I don't have a, oops, I don't have a pointer. But if you look, you'll see right along at the right where it says 2.9 over 18.2, 2030. Now, 2030 is around the corner. This is the percentage of people over the age of 85. So although it's a small percentage, it's a huge number of people. So from those of us who are responsible for making policy, for trying to plan, this is the number we're, number we're looking at. The fact is we are going to have to respond to the needs of an increasingly aging population and everybody surrounding them, which is spouses, children, grandchildren, etc. Now, the Alzheimer's Society has done a very important, credible job in bringing awareness to the public of something that really wasn't in most people's minds until relatively recently. And I'll say most people's, including the healthcare professional. I mean, when I was in training, Alzheimer's disease was considered a rare, unusual condition. Right? We did not use the term for the elderly people that I, I trained in Scotland. Anybody here from Scotland? Okay, so I drink Dundee, Scotland. I won't speak in Dundonian because nobody will understand. But this one you'll understand. So we labeled people that now would be called having Alzheimer's or dementia, they were just a wee bit dotty. 
and the word that was used was senility. Now, which all that means is old. But everybody recognized that if you lived long enough, you would become a bit dotty. So you would be confused, you'd get lost, whatever. And we were we looked after them as we did, but it wasn't configured as this is really dangerous. <laughs> it doesn't <it> bite. <laughs> it looks like a cobra. <laughs> um, we didn't really have a framework that we now have, what you might call it a medical, clinical framework with an identification, a course, interventions, mode of treatment, imperfect that they are. So the Alzheimer's societies around the world, and the Canadian is really one of the very good ones, have really brought it to the attention of the public, which is important, but also to policymakers. And they're out there all the time. So this report, the Alzheimer's Society, did called the Rising Tide. Now there's an issue with using of terminology, and I'm one of the people that doesn't like to use terminology that only has bad connotations. So tsunami is a very popular term to describe the aging population. Now, there's nothing good in tsunamis. I've never heard anybody talk about tsunamis positively, like this is a bombing tsunami. Or, you know, it's bad. So when you put it in front of aging, it only connotes negative things. So even though they used rising tide, I'm not too happy, it doesn't matter. At least what they did was a very important report. And I'm going to just give you a very, very, very short summary of it because I'm simple. And that is, this is a slide. This is a statistical slide. I tell people who are looking at statistical slides, is just imagine, if it's going up, it's bad. <laughs> the way this slide is configured. So here it is, prevalence of dementia in Canada by age group, 208 to 230, 2038, and it's going up. All that says is, over the next 10, 15, 20 years, the number of people with dementia is going to rise. Okay? This is the same slide broken down by male or female. So it shows there is a difference in propensity based on a million factors. Uh, that's a whole other talk <coughs> as why women live longer than men. Da, 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 da. But the fact is, it's also going up. So what we are challenged with is the increase in the number of people, male and female, in North America, in Canada, who will develop some sort of dementia. Now, with those great achievements, we face new challenges. They, elderly, have a lot to contend with as they get older. And family members, while joyful at longevity, must also be prepared for difficult times, challenging times. It's not simple. That doesn't mean it's bad, but it's not simple. So we're going to look at both sides of the equation to try to help equip those involved with how to make it work as well as we can. We may not succeed in all our goals, but we should be able to try and achieve the best that one can hope for in an imperfect world. It's sort of interesting, my, my, what do I call her? My eldest child, who's a daughter of my second marriage, because I have two sets, and they're both daughter, son, daughter, son, is, is studying to be a medical anthropologist. So I've learned to look at the world through a lens of anthropology. <clears throat> and part of what that means is you look at the culture of any society, how it looks at all issues related to health. And the North American society, America, Canada, but much of the Western world, looks at health as a challenge to be solved. And if you look especially at America, it's always a war against. We have a war against cancer, war against dementia, or, you know, and that's because for us, for whatever reasons, framing it as a war allows you to say, this is something we can succeed at. We have a long history of doing well in wars. Not always so well, but it doesn't matter. You know what it is. You fight the battle, you find the right tools, right? the right armaments, which in medicine are drugs and surgery, and at the end you will succeed. Now, if you've been following this long enough, you realize that these wars don't always succeed in the way you might think. You may win individual battles, and cancer is a very good example. 
because we haven't cured cancer, you know, as you would say, in a war, but we've been able to treat many components of what we call cancer in a way that allows some people to actually <clears throat> survive as if they didn't have it, and others survive for some period of time, and others, I'm afraid of this. <laughs> <clears throat> so within this world of dementia, it's also a challenge in terms of how you approach what you're going to do and whether you think you have the tool or tools to eliminate it. Most of us believe that's unlikely. But control it, decrease it, help cope with it, we hope. Whether something else happens, who knows. But I've been in the business for a long time, and I'm often asked, well, surely there must be something better than we have. And the example I often give in my office practice when people say, well, surely, Dr. Gordon, you work at Baycrest, right? There must be something better than this. And I say, you know, you know who Ronald Reagan is? Yeah, President of the United States. Whether you liked him or not, something else. Margaret Thatcher, yeah. Well, you know, they both had the same condition as your mother. They're very famous people. They had access to everything. And you know what treatment they got? What your mother's getting. If you saw the movie The Iron Lady, I went to see it only because I wanted to use it as the basis of helping discuss <coughs> with patients, because there's a scene in the early when she goes into a little grocery store. And you can see she's mixed up with the price of milk when she says, what? Four shillings? Because she's going back to when milk was a shilling. And then she couldn't count the money. So right now, this is where we're at. On the horizon, there's not a blockbuster. <clears throat> but we are all working on many components. So let's look at the different components. Now, First of all, for those who are the care providers, so the strategies. So you have to understand the situation. You have to understand who are the people involved. Doctors, nurses, home care workers, whoever the players are. And it, it's just sort of interesting. You'd think that, well, if you're a doctor or a nurse, it must be easier. So I'm just going to tell you, as a doctor who's dealt with it in my own family, it could be an occupational hazard. One of the problems with being a healthcare professional doctor and dealing with, especially your own families, you're always at risk of second guessing and knowing more than the person who you've asked. So the rule most of us, I think, have learned is you find somebody who you trust, who you think is good, and you defer to them. Um, so just because you happen to have a healthcare professional in your family, and there's a big tendency to always ask, I have a nephew who's a third year medical resident who wants to be a geriatrician, and what I've learned is everybody's now turning to him as the specialist in the family. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm the in-law. They don't ask me, which I prefer. <clears throat> so it's important to understand your parents or loved ones, what their functional status is. When we say functional status, that's a, you might say, a. Uh, short form of what can they do, what can't they do, what things do they need help for, what would happen if they didn't get help for that thing. In other words, what's going on in their lives. And to get an idea as much as possible as what's the likely course of events. Now, in medicine, one of the things we often do, and people ask it to, to do, <coughs> is prognosticate. Oh, I get a new water. And that's to say, what will be? And throughout human history of medicine, long before doctors really had much to work with, they were very good observers. They put together what they could see. And one of the important questions asked throughout history is, what does this mean? What will be? And doctors, even without the scientific knowledge, got pretty good at estimating what's likely to happen. Being bitten by a rattlesnake, even when you didn't know about venom, you knew that if it was the right kind of snake, it wasn't good. 
Okay. You didn't need the science, but you needed to be observant as to what you've seen around you. So that when people come with their loved one to a doctor and a, a diagnosis is made of dementia or whatever, they want to know, besides what you can do, there's a limitation with you, what does this mean? What's the course? And how am I going to plan for it? What am I going to have to do? Now, depending on where you live, you want to know what's the resources. I'm very lucky. I live in Toronto. We have an abundance with all the complaints and deficiencies. I mean, one thing I've learned is, I had a conversation with Ruby, we have the same problems. There's never enough money. I've been in the business for 40 years. We've had a budget deficit every year. And still we're growing. But what's around? If you live in Montreal, you've got a lot of stuff. You've got a lot of resources. If you live in other parts, not far away, you may not have those resources. And that has implications for how you're going to plan. Now, another important thing is knowing the preferences of the person you are acting on behalf of. Now, that's important because depending on your family and your communication skills, you may or may not talk about important subjects. So I'm going to ask the audience. How many people here have indicated, I'll say to their children, it could be another person, what if Hasba Halila, God forbid, something terrible happens? That was Hebrew for God forbid. I can say God forbid like you did in Sholem Aleichem or whatever. I can say that in a few languages also. If something were to happen, some horrible, and they have. And they happen unanticipated. I tell my children, you know, they say, oh, I'm only cycling around the neighborhood without a helmet. I say, you know, that's why they're called accidents, because you don't anticipate them. Have you indicated to those who may be responsible for caring for you what you want? How many? You can raise your hand. I'm not taking the poll. The important thing is it's not everybody. How many people here pay their taxes? Oh, I shouldn't ask that. Because <laughs> it's the same level, right? I mean, you might say, how could you not be talking about it? This is a vital component of communication because if something were to happen and your child has to make a decision without knowing what you would want, you may not get what you want. Now, it doesn't mean you get what you want in life, but at least what your preferences are. So I try, for example, in my own practice, to explain to families and to help them as a little example as to what decisions may have to go into deciding what their mother or father may want in the event of. So this is often called an advanced directive, advanced care planning, living will, all these terms are just a way of formulating, it doesn't have to be written, written some people prefer, what it is that you would like for yourself should the unexpected, unanticipated, unwished for happen. So what else? Well, everything slows down. For those in the audience who have moved on in years, you will know that you can't do as much as you did before. However good you try, however much you exercise, there's always limitations. So the sense of time is often running at a different rate for older parents. I'm using parents and children, but you can see it's generational. And one of the things you have to learn to do is to slow down. Because it may take longer for the same thing to be accomplished. Comprehension, even in people who are cognitively intact, may slow down for various reasons. Hearing, the ability to frame components of speech into meaningful uh, sentence structure. One of the things we tend to do is include a lot of data in a sentence. And it can be very confusing for somebody, even when they're pretty good cognitively, to break up the different pieces of what you're doing. We have to learn that as doctors, so that we don't say to somebody, when you leave the office, by the way, remember, you have to go there, do this, that's five things, as opposed to breaking it up one at a time. Sometimes you write it down, so it's not forgotten. 
So you have to slow down how you talk, how you walk. The last thing, and you see it a lot, is the child walking and the parent is behind. <laughs> now, sometimes you see it not with parents and, and, and parents, with other people, but that's for other reasons that they don't want to be walking together. <laughs> um, so it's important to learn to pace yourself, especially if the person is using a walking aid. They can't necessarily walk faster. So you can decide you're not going to do it together, or you're going to do it at the pace that's suitable so you are doing it together. And you need the time to make sure that the information can be processed. So communication is very important. This little statement I have learned to listen again and again. So this came out of a conversation I had with this medical anthropology daughter I mentioned. We were driving somewhere and I started telling her, I'm a big storyteller. I love telling stories. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, that's what life is all about. It's just a collection of stories and when you run out of them, they bury you. <laughs> and I believe that in the future, you're going to give a chip to the funeral parlor. They will put it into your tombstone, and anybody who wants can watch the stories. <laughs> so anyway, I was telling her whichever story it was, and she said, in the typical way, I know. Has anybody ever done that? Oh, yeah. I know. I've heard that. I know. So I said, listen, Tali, Tali's name. I have to tell you something. It's very important. The fact that you know is not the issue. The issue is, I feel like telling you the story. Now, why is that important? So number one, the story is important to me. The story represents something in my life. And the fact that you heard it before doesn't mean that it's still not meaningful. So I'm going to ask you in the future, when you hear one of the stories, and we all tell the stories. We all know that over and over again. And you roll your eyes and stuff. Oh, here we are again in the Catskills. This is the cat. The Catskills story is that you have to listen. And you have to listen because the reason I'm telling the story is it's meaningful for me. And in many ways, the reason we tell stories, and I'm serious about this, our world is really a collection of narratives. It's how we identify ourselves. And why a particular story comes out is because of something external. You hear something on the radio, you say, oh, I've also been on an ocean cruise liner that lost power. Remember that story? Oh, yeah, that, I remember that story. It was Corsica, right? Yeah, oh, good. Anyway, the thing is, it's important. That's how we relate. Um, and one of the problems is how much help to provide, because one of the things that's very important that people need is a sense of maintaining their independence. It's very important. We all want to. So although you want to help, you have to, knowing the person, how much help is necessary to help without undermining independence. And that's a very delicate balance. And sometimes you have to actually talk about it. You have to ask, what would you like me to do if, here, what, when, walking, talking, upstairs, downstairs? So, for example, if there's anybody in the audience that wants to take my garbage out on Tuesday morning, you are welcome to do it. It's almost the only thing I don't like about still living in the house. It's really, it's awful. First of all, I have to go out early. I get up early anyway. But even though they give you these carts, they have that here on wheels, and they recycle, it's like 14 different boxes. And then, of course, we have raccoons. Do you have raccoons? Yeah. Oh, really? Do they, do they speak French? <laughs> you know, you put your garbage out early, and in the morning, you've got to pick up the garbage. <laughs> so the thing is, depending on how you speak to this important person in life, they will internalize it, and they'll react, especially if you're impatient. We all react to impatience, and you sense it very easily. It's like, come on, come on, come on. You know? Come on, come on. I know. And you finish the sentence for them. So you have to be very careful. Be slow. Slow down. Be patient. Okay, dignity and respect. Well, look, you can't take anybody for granted. That's a universal. You can't take anybody for granted. But especially when it comes to dealing with parents, grandparents, 
They need to feel, we all need to feel important. It's one of the touchstones of the human condition. I can't talk about dolphins or whales or dogs. I'm willing to bet they too have a system that allows them to feel important within their own social. We know it from, from, from uh, um, the, uh, chimpanzees and gorillas. And, you know, they have their structure and order. But lately, I've, I've put up um, uh, bird feeders, and I've started watching birds. And I've learned there is an order. There is an order. Who goes and we have some cardinals come, right? Who goes and is allowed to feed first? The red ones. The brown ones wait. That's the female, of course. <laughs> and the real challenge is, and this is in many ways like raising children in a way that as long as they're making a decision that you think is, I'll use the word, safe enough, you have to let it happen. Because you can't protect completely. And if you're trying to protect a parent completely, you basically take away from them the ability to do anything. Now, I'll give you an example for those who work in hospitals. Somebody falls. Children say, why didn't you prevent my mother from falling? Mother, as they said. You should have prevented from Now, I guarantee you, I can prevent anybody from falling in a hospital. I just have to tie them down. <laughs> seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. Seriously, we have to pass laws some years ago, so you can't do that anymore. Because everybody was afraid of falling. Because you fall, you fracture, you do, and the family's unhappy, and you're sued. And the, I mean, it's a balance of trying to make it as safe as possible to walk. And that's what we do. We do home assessments, get rid of the scatter rugs. Anybody have a scatter rug in their house? They're dangerous. For an older person, they can be really dangerous. That's why we do these so-called home assessments. Scatter rugs, I mean, we've all been, we do this in homes where you got wire stretching across, you got scatter rugs, you have all kinds of dangerous things. So you have to decide what can you allow a person to do that may have some dangers, on the other hand, it's important for their independence. And you do the best to decrease the risk while maintaining the most independence possible. And that includes all kinds of decisions uh, in terms of, I mean, even what they're eating. You may think they should eat Diet X, but they don't want to eat Diet X. I had a patient who was a true 100 years old. He happened to be the grandfather of a colleague of Ruben and I, who's a geriatrician, and I ended up looking after him. He was a true hunter based on his Polish birth certificate. Anyway, he ate what he ate, and he also drank two ounces of uh, Canadian Club. He was actually the, the poster man for Canadian Club, Seagram's. Anyway, one daughter always came on the visits, who was the mother of this colleague of ours, and we always got along. And one visit, she couldn't come, so she sent a sister who I'd never met. All the sister talked about is her father's diet, how it was an unhealthy diet. <laughs> right? It was an unhealthy diet. And I listened, and yeah, I'm mean, sure, sure, yes, yes, she probably should eat less of, more of. And at one point, I said, you know, your dad's 100. He must be doing something right. Maybe not perfect, but he must be doing something right. So we have to learn how to accept the imperfections of human beings and also preferences. I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't do something that's not good for them. How dull. <laughs> I mean, really dull. And, and that, that's part of our world. You know, the, the most popular day at Baycrest for people going to the cafeteria is Delhi Thursday. <laughs> Delhi Thursday is suicide. <laughs> corned beef, we make good corned beef. We don't call it smoked beef. Corned beef. Fries on a bun with a pickle for $6.99. There isn't a, you could come. There isn't a better deal in town. People line up a half hour before it opens. They say, how could we, a healthcare facility, be serving this stuff? It's because people like it. <laughs> people like it. And unless we suddenly say we're going to be the ultra, ultra Puritans, 
I mean, I sort of jokingly say, and sometimes people say I overdo it, is what caused the big problems in the United States is the Puritans took over. So they've taken anything that's good and made it evil. <laughs> right? Think about it. And we have to be careful that we don't over try to control for the benefits of whatever that thing is called health. So the making of decisions on behalf of our parents is part of that. Even though we may be able to make it faster and maybe better, you have to let them, as much as they can, do it. So they want to have control of their lives, and they can never stop being a parent. And you all know that. The number of times your older parent will tell you to do something. You are an adult. You're an adult, and your older parent tells you, remember to wear a jacket. <laughs> I remember coming home from medical school. I didn't come home very often. It was expensive. Coming home and going out, and it was December, and my mother said, what are you wearing? And I said, I'm wearing a ski jacket. It was one of these, because I actually learned how to ski. So it wasn't like a real winter coat, but it was quite warm. But she looked at it and says, how could you go out with that? You know, and then you catch a cold and all that stuff. <laughs> so they can't help being a parent. And that comes with the territory. And you, if you haven't been there, you'll see. That, you know what Jerry said, you'll see. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be a parent. You can't help it. So you have to be able to not respond and react when your parent gives you what is normal parental advice, recommendations, etc. And you have to be sensitive to what the frustrations go into the fact that they recognize that they're frail. I use the word frailing. Frail, ailing. That they can't do, and it's frustrating. And, and some people act out differently than others. So, in terms of dignity and respect, there are certain moments. And Moments That Matter is the title of one of my books. I'm not selling them. I didn't bring up crate full of them. But there are certain things that happen that are, are landmarks in this process. One is the most difficult, which is driving. Right? Driving. Now, we forget that driving isn't a right, it's a privilege. There are rules of engagement, there are laws. And as a physician, one of the hardest things we do, I would say it's harder than giving a bad diagnosis. And I've given very bad diagnoses in my life is telling somebody that for whatever the process was, and I never do it in a one-shot deal, it's a process that you're, and you, you have to be careful what you're saying, because you're not saying, I'm taking your license away, because we're not. We have to report you to the Motor Vehicle Bureau. That's, yeah. that's the law. Okay? And of course, there's often a pushback at the why and this, and you have to have a process, but it can be, have a very negative impact on the person, especially men, especially men in terms of independence, loss of freedom, but it's even beyond that. It's a symbol of your failure. And sometimes it really has an impact depending on where you live. And although we all learn techniques to help people understand, I mean, I've done many of the computation, that selling your car, canceling your insurance, canceling your parks, that you can take a thousand taxis a year and all you do is go to the local law laws. So, yeah, but I can't go when I want to go. Have you ever tried to get a taxi in North York? And they're right. It's different from having your own car. But it's important. We have to take the responsibility. We know there are many people driving who shouldn't. And that's because family physicians in particular, but I've seen it in geriatricians, who don't want to be the bad guy. Right? You don't want to be the person. And I've seen families beg not to. And I've also seen families beg, please, please do something because it's dangerous. Then the next special moment is the first significant fall with a break, the devastating break. And for any of us who've done it, you know it changes the world. My father, for example, was, uh, I guess he was about 95. He was living in a retirement home. He had mild dementia. He was managing well. He was enjoying. He was a remarkable man. And he was doing all the right things. 
He even reluctantly accepted the walker. He was originally reluctant, but he was an engineer, and we said try it. We knew that for him to say try it didn't mean you have to do it forever. Try it for two weeks. And after two, he says, you know what? This is really great. Look at this design. And he analyzed it structurally as an engineer would. And he said, you know what the best thing about this is? What do you think the best thing about a walker is? Who said that? The seat. Because there aren't seats where you go walking. He had his own seat. What? Exactly. OK. But it's interesting. So even though you know you do the right thing, he ended up missing the walker as he was getting out of bed, broke his hip, and the world changed. The world changed. And we all see this. Even though we're pretty good at the orthopod, put the screw in and then knock the nail and whatever, he never was the same. The next one, and I know in my own father's case, went together as part of the process, was selling the house. Now some people do it logically, planned, as part of a life plan, but sometimes you're selling the house because suddenly you can no longer live in it. You don't realize that you've passed the point of being able to do it safely and independently. And I saw it in my late father. He was literally becoming a hermit after my mother died. She was the social magnet. And she died, and he became almost a hermit. He went out in the morning, got the New York Times and two bagels, and occasionally, uh, initially at least, went to the supermarket. We knew that because he paid with the credit card that my sister was responsible for. And then that started decreasing. And we saw him in his house, it was one of the birthdays, and it was a disaster. Because he was an engineer, he never called in anybody to fix something. And in his heyday, he was really good. But in the latter years, he was fixing everything. I thought my father invented duct tape. Because <laughs> the house was held together with duct tape. So I just, as an aside, I inherited that. I just, I was telling you, pulled the bumper off my car last night. It is back where it is temporarily, but it's clear duct tape. It looks good. <laughs> anyway, we moved him to Chicago, where my sister was living, temporarily in a retirement home. Why temporarily? He was willing to try, as long as it wasn't a commitment. And after a few weeks of some good medical care and removal of some drugs he was taking over the counter, he was much better. And he said, I want to go back to New York. So my sister, who's very, very clever, she's a psychiatric social worker, she knows his personality, you have to know personalities, said, you know, Dad, if you go back to New York, we're going to lose the two months deposit we put on the retirement home because we booked you for three months. And you will lose it. It's uh, $2,000. Oh, I'm not going to lose it. I'll stay till I finish the three months. And fortunately, during that period, he had a medical disaster related to regularity, which, if you know, can be awful. And my sister spent the night in his room plying him with prunes and everything else under the sun until success occurred. And what he said in the morning was, you saved my life, sell the house. Seriously. I mean, ornamenting a little bit, but it was give or take a little like that. The next stage that's often very difficult is when you have to move, and this with my father was concurrent, moving into assisted living and nursing home. He didn't want to. He wanted to stay in the house that I grew up in last 12 years and manage with the duct tape. And we went to visit and things were falling apart. We said, Dad, you know, and we never told him anything. We always asked him, and he allowed him to, he said, you're going to have to move into something. And he said, I don't know, I like it here. I said, Dad, it's a disaster here. There's mouse droppings everywhere. Said, you know, they're very entertaining. <laughs> anyway, he reluctantly made the move, and I told you the other part. And it's not an easy transition even when it works well. It works best if the person says, I need more help, I want to move, I'm going to find a place. Right? That's like the Brady Bunch, you know, the ideal. But it doesn't usually work quite as easily as that. And then you have all the other signs that something's wrong, not using the phone properly, picking up the, the, the uh, television, thinking it's the phone, you know, all these things. 
And the ones that are really critical for us in the field, and we always ask, did you leave the stove on? Now, fortunately, you can't anymore easily, and I don't know how many people, do you have gas a lot in, in uh, Montreal? You know, it's, hard, it's harder to gas yourself to death. You can blow up the house, but that's different. Uh, but water running, you know, happens a lot. Managing medication, I mean, it's <coughs> our bread and butter. And for those of us who do geriatrics, and we work carefully with pharmacists and all kinds of others, to do whatever we can to maximize the ability of that person to take what they're supposed to take at the right time and the right amount, knowing full well there'll be some misses. And fortunately, there's enough flexibility in all these drugs that if it misses a few, it doesn't matter a lot. You do your best to see, but when people are really missing, and with my, again, my late father, it's funny because anybody who reads the Canadian Jewish News knew my father, because I wrote about him a lot. And I once asked him, and he said, sure, my pleasure, be my guest. So he was taking medication, including the ones he used for cognitive impairment. And we realized he was missing doses. So we worked out a system where we would call him, say, Dad, go take the pill, come back, tell us on the phone that you took the pill. And that worked for about a year. And one evening I called him, he was taking him the evening at that point, to tell him to take the pill. He said yes, and he didn't come back to the phone. So what happened is he forgot that he was on the phone. So it became clear that that system wasn't working, so we had to put him the next level, which was somebody from the retirement home, was a nurse, came and gave him the pill. I mean, we have systems that we put in. If you can't do it yourself, what's the least intrusive way you can get it done? We have blister packs, we have all kinds of, you know, I've seen very complex technologies that the thing speaks to you. It's time for your pills, right? And it rotates. And, but usually you can do it pretty simply. Very important is sharing laughter, rich memories, and those special moments that matter. This is part of what I said earlier in terms of the narrative of life. You have to be able to bring out the best of memories, associations, and there are ways of doing it. You want to have people talking. Photographs are wonderful. Having people look at pictures and tell you what's in them. Funny memories to relive. That's what we do when we get together at holidays. What do you do? You talk about old times. Do you remember when? I mean, we still talk about the time that my daughter drank herself silly at Passover and barfed all over my best pair of pants. Every time we get together at Passover, that story comes out. And everybody's laughing, because they all remember it. So we want to know about their past. It's very important. It, it, it kind of um, proves to them that they had an important life. I mentioned earlier learning to listen. If there are grandchildren, nothing beats grandchildren. Pets. Very important. There's a whole literature now on the importance of pets, among other things. Something to give meaning. So these are a couple of pictures. This is my late father when he was hospitalized for whatever in Chicago. The other guy's me. Uh, pictures, so when he was in hospital and he was sick, we, my sister made this montage of the important characters in his life. And what was interesting is whenever we would go, we'd ask him who was, and when we pointed to the one with, on your complete left, which is obviously my mother and father's wedding picture, I'd say, who's this? And he'd say the same thing. That's your mother. Wasn't she beautiful? Now just imagine what that brought out in his associations. It didn't matter that we asked him the day before. And gradually, you know, he'd say, yeah, that's uh, that is, uh, daughter. That's his great-grandchild. Couldn't remember names. But he could recognize. Very important. This was looking at some pictures. While I was there, I printed up for him. And this one is priceless. Because he was in the hospital when my daughter happened to be uh, in Israel. And she called him. And this is a picture of a person laughing and crying at the same time. He was so moved. Because he recognized her voice, and he said, you know, where are you? 
And she said, and he just broke down and laughed because she always made him laugh. So what else? Stay close to the people looking out. Ask lots of questions. Compare the answers. If you're in a place that you can get a geriatrician or care of the elderly, do so. Ask about medications. You should know the medications. You should know what the issues are. Don't become a, 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 a kind of amateur pharmacist. Because the worst thing I have, and that's a whole other talk, is when the family looks up a drug. They all kill you. Everyone lists death. Did you know that? Because they list anything that ever happened. So I'm not going to give my mother that. Why not? You can die. So we have to be very careful to have family members put it in perspective. I often say, so how did you get to my office today? I said, well, I came on the 401. You came on the 401, and you're not going to take Tylerol? I mean, the 401, that's dangerous. So you look at, as I mentioned earlier, different ways of getting the medication. If it's an assisted living, sometimes you have help depending on who they are, and you have to see what the services are, what they're able to provide. You got to talk about the idea of advanced care planning. It's now a very topical um, uh, undertaking. All the medical organizations in Ontario are certainly involved with in Canada. And we have to remember that medical technology is not always going to get you what you want in life. Even though we have lots of gizmos now that sound really potentially promising, sometimes it's a false promise. We have to be sure that's what we want. So what are we going to talk about of the things that in your advanced care planning, the big ones that come up that we face all the time? So-called artificial nutrition hydration, tube feeding, and the child says, I can't let my mother starve. So it's the wrong construct. Because that's not what you're doing. The condition, the illness is such that the person can no longer take in food. You're not feeding them. You're giving them artificial nutrition hydration. It's not what you call feeding. Or eating is the word. Because eating is not just getting nutritional calories and minerals. It's the enjoyment of the social enterprise of eating and sharing and drinking. That's what the human condition is all about. And it's the same for every other mammalian. I don't know about reptiles, and I don't know about plants. But every mammalian enjoys sharing food. You just have to watch them. You watch birds, you watch chimpanzees, you watch dolphins. They share food with each other because that's part of the bonding of the species. And certainly, for us, what's it all about? I mean, you don't invite people over for Friday night and say, I'm going to provide you with 800 calories of nutrient-filled. <laughs> Is that a brisket? <laughs> So the other one is, and you have to be able to respond to that, I can't let my mother starve. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I can't be responsible for my father's death. Now I've been in this business a long time, and of the areas of my own research, happen to be the futility of CPR in the frail elderly population. It doesn't achieve what you think it is. It's not resurrection. It doesn't work. And from my perspective, when I want to be blunt, all it means is as your mother, father's dying, you're beating them up at the same time. And I've done enough of them to tell you, I know. You're not achieving your goal, and it's cruel. So you have to have that discussion that this is how we go, this is how we leave the world, and what we want to do is make people comfortable and not use something that's misplaced. CPR is good if you are an electrician lineman working for Quebec Hydro, and you foolishly touch the wrong two wires, but you've got a healthy heart and a working brain, and you collapse, and somebody knows what to do. And the main thing, it's an electrical death. The treatment is electrical. You defibrillate. It's not all that pumping. And pumping is, is temporary until you can do the electrical. But with older people, it's just everything is failing, and the final common pathway is your heart stops. That's how you die. So you have to be able to say that. This is not going to get you what you want. It's a horrible way to have an end. And then there's all the interventions we have for end-of-life medical treatments. Fancy mycin, this antibiotic, that. It doesn't get you what you want. It may get it temporarily, but you want to know what it is, the goal, so that at the end, when you're sitting in, whether it's the shiva or the wake, you say, you know, we did the right thing. 
we were able to do the right thing to make mom comfortable, etc. Oops. Now, you got to plan ahead for you. Your parents are going to get older, frailer. When and how, you have to have the conversations. Know what the expectations are while people are still able to have the conversations. They're not always easy, but we underestimate how often older people really want to have the conversations and settle it. So you have to find ways. There are different ways. It's very often when somebody in the family's died and they say, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. That's a good opening. So sometimes it's just simple things. Where are things? Where are things that you're going to need? So I have a file. And it's funny because every time I travel, I remind my wife, this is the death file. <laughs> it's here. It tells you who to call because I have a pre-planned funeral. I even have transportation back because I go overseas a lot. This is the accountant, the investment advisor, da 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 da. These are the four phone, my insurance. With these four phone calls, you'll be okay. And I'll be okay. Whatever that is. <laughs> so that's the easy part. I talk about pre planning funeral because it's important. Healthcare, finances, and then the whole thing is with children who should take what role? I just have a, my own. Bias, I never give the idea of power of attorney to all children equally. If you want to open the door to sibling conflict, that's how you do it. Because I don't care who you are, I've never met, and I have a really great sister, I've never met a family where all the siblings agreed about everything. And there's a whole literature about which sibling has what because they're the first, the second, or the third. So you decide who's going to take the lead, and you make sure the communication is there. And I went through this, again, with my sister and my, both my parents. But for you, the caregiver, you have to find a balance. You know there's going to be decline. There's going to be stress and demands. It's going to affect your work life. I'm going to finish very soon. No, 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 so. don't, don't, don't finish. I just have to make a quick announcement. Um, uh, for those of you in the uh, second room in the TV land, I'm sorry we could only keep that room till 6.45. But you're very welcome to come over here to hear the conclusion of the talk and to ask the uh, questions. There is a little bit of, uh, of room, so you can come over shortly. I thought sorry. I was getting the hook. <laughs> <laughs> so it affects your work life. I've had many children who had to decide among them who was going to take time off and who was not. It can have profound effect on, on marriages, on spouses, and relationships to kids. I've had children tell me that they hated, in quotes, their grandparent because their parent spent all their time looking after their grandparent. They said to their detriment. Now, there was something wrong with the communication there, unfortunately, because that's the reality of their life. You have to be able to understand what it means. You need a social life. You need me space. I tell people, you know what? Going out to Starbucks, if you like to do that, for an hour and having a coffee, doesn't mean you're a bad wife or a bad child. You may need that time. So you have to build it in and structure how you're going to do it. You've got to get support from those who you love. And remember, if you don't take care of yourself and fail because you burned yourself out, they automatically fail. So now you have two failures. So you have to have a way to make sure that you can survive this, and it's not easy. You can't do it all. They don't, parents always see that you know everything. Um, you gotta decide when you're gonna argue, when you're gonna get into conflict. You gotta get help. You gotta know your family dynamic, uh, dynamics and roles, and that's not easy. All families have their dynamics and conflicts and, and sensitive buttons that if you push them, you know, you end up with the same argument you've had for 40 years. Who are the key people for help? Whoever. It could be clergy, it could be a family lawyer, it could be family doctor, friends, parents, advisors, whoever. Whoever's there who knows, who's willing to help, books, whatever. And you mix and match them as is required and necessary and useful. Guilt. Don't knock it, it's a living. I said that as a quote from Freud. Don't knock it, it's a living. So we have two kinds of guilt. 
guilt that our parents force upon us. You're not doing, you're not doing, you're not doing. And certainly in practice, I see lots where the parent is accusing the child of being whatever. You don't love us anymore. You know, I won't last till morning. And the, the, the really important guilt is the self-inflicted guilt. What should I have done? What else can I do? What did I miss? Are they suffering? And that's hard, because that's how we interpret what's going on for ourselves. And we have a different answer, all of us. And you have to be able to answer honestly. You look in the mirror, and you say, am I doing the best I can? I'm not a perfect person, but am I really doing the best I can? And if you say, yes, yeah, the best I can, that's the best you can do. And you have to come to terms with it. And if you need help in order to come to terms with it, you get help. There are people, I know in our own organization, we have family support groups to help the, the caregivers. But there are different ways of getting help, professional help. So you know you're not alone. There are lots of people, organizations, national, local. Millions of people are sharing this. This is not your unique experience, although it feels very lonely sometimes. So although this may not be a GPS, hopefully it will give you some direction. It's like a map. If you're used to a GPS, you take out a map and say, oh my god, I have to read. What is it? This? Oh, the numbers are rolled. You know, you're not used to it after a while if you got used to using a GPS. But it's a multifactorial wayfinder. Way For those who are interested in any of my books, I didn't bring them with me because it's a schlep to take them on an airplane. So Parenting Your Parents is my latest. It's the third edition of a book that came out in 202. I know it's a good book, not because I say so, but people who've read it and reviewed it have said so. My co-author went through the same thing with his parents. And that's how we started this. And so I gave out cards for those who were able to get it that have my website. The website, there's a blog website of the book. And you get it at uh, Indigo Chapters, Amazon, whatever. Uh, late Stage Dementia is a book I wrote for those dealing with people in the later stages of dementia to help them get through it, not only families but professionals. Moments and Matter is my own area of interest in ethics that deals with some of the ethical issues. And the one on the bottom, Brooklyn Beginnings, is my memoir. For those who like reading stories, I enjoy writing it more than anything else I've ever written. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gordon.